Blue Moon is brewed with Valencia orange peel and a touch of coriander. It's a creative twist on a Belgian-style wheat ale for a taste that shines brighter. Taste responsibly. Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. This is Sports Center at 6. As King James and the Cavs face the hottest team in the East, Isaiah Thomas is officially closer to his return, and his attitude is worse. Why, that's actually a good thing. He tweaked his knee last week, but his mouth works just fine. Kristaps Porzingis sits with Rachel Nichols. Are the Pats worried about the Bills retaliating for this Gronk hit? We're live in Foxborough. And an OTL exclusive, the Louisville recruit at the center of a controversy that cost Rick Potato his job on what he knew about a big money payment. Hey, what's good? Welcome to Sports Center. Our show still gifted and graced with the presence of L. Duncan. Speaking of gifts, later we'll talk to the Grinch who's trying to steal the greatness of the NBA on Christmas. And Jadevian Clowney won't get cold in his stocking, but he did get a pretty trashy gift <laughs> from yes. Jags fans. Plus, how Jacksonville's opponent this Sunday, San Francisco, finally struck gold in its search for a quarterback. Yeah, but let's start with the 6-6 Cavs with their final tune-up before their much-hyped Christmas bout with the Dubs. Don't look past Chicago, though, something no one thought we'd be saying a month ago, Mike, after these teams met. So the Bulls, they've won seven straight, led by Nikola Mirotic, formerly known as the guy who got punched in the face by his teammate. Formerly known as the heartbeat of the Celtics was Isaiah Thomas. He has yet to strap up for Cleveland, but he's getting close, and LeBron's putting us on attitude notice. Yeah, his attitude is getting worse and worse. Because <laughs> he's getting closer and closer. When you get closer and closer to something that you love and you want, your attitude actually gets worse. So, you know. so then IT tweeted, can I still be an all-star? The answer actually is um, yes, because Alonzo Mourning was selected in 2001, having played no games before the all-star break started. So there it is. Let's talk to our Cavs reporter, Dave McMenamin, who's live from Quicken. Give us a progress report on IT. Well, L, all signs pointing positive. Uh, he went through a full scrimmage today with the Canton Charge. They actually came up uh, about the hour and a half drive to Cleveland to practice at the Cavs facility in Independence, Ohio. Uh, but even though it, all, all signs pointed to positive progress from that first time playing five on five, Ty Lue told us pregame tonight that Isaiah Thomas will not be on the court come Monday for that Christmas Day showdown against the Golden State Warriors. So as much hype there is behind that game, and and certainly people are going to tune in to ABC to watch the Cavs and the Warriors, you're not going to see Steph Curry. He was ruled out earlier this week, and you won't see Isaiah Thomas. So the point guard battle, not quite as attractive as, say, the small forward battle between Kevin Durant and LeBron James. Uh, Exactly. But with a hip injury, why rush him back? Cavs have won 18 of their last 20. They good. Dave McMenamin joining us live from Quicken ahead of the Cavs and the Bulls. Mike? Celtics coming off taking an L to the Heat last night in New York tonight. Chris Stapps Porzingis has been out the past two games due to lingering soreness in his left knee. Not believed to be serious. Knicks just being cautious. Ian Begley is the unicorn in tonight. He hopes to be in. The Knicks hope that he is in tonight, but we're still not sure. The Knicks held a closed-door shoot-around earlier today. We can assume that Porzingis tested his knee and was examined by team doctors. We should find out his status definitively in a few minutes here. But in talking to Porzingis yesterday, he seemed pretty confident that he'd be able to take the court tonight. He practiced in full yesterday. He didn't feel a lot of discomfort. He said, hey, guys, if nothing changes between now, which was yesterday, and tonight, I'll be able to play. And the Knicks really need him back. You know, they are 2-4 and four in games in which Porzingis has missed due to injury. And they're just a different ball club with that number six on the floor. Not only is he giving them a ton on the offensive end, tied for fourth in the NBA in scoring, he's also doing a fantastic job around the rim, averaging 2.1 blocks per night. So the Knicks are holding their breath right now that Porzingis can play. Yeah, we'll put those numbers in context momentarily. So they got Detroit tomorrow night, Christmas Day against Philly. Knicks currently eighth in the East at 16 and 14. Ian, I saw your piece on ESPN.com going inside the implosion that rebuilt the New York Knicks. Uh, This quote from one of your team's sources stood out to me. Quote, everyone one just seems a little lighter. The drama Phil created with Carmelo really affected the team and the joy factor. How has that newfound or perhaps rediscovered joy manifested itself in the Knicks play? 
Well, Mike, as you know, winning helps everything. So I know. the Knicks are sitting Don't here 16 it. and 14. They're, they're winning games, so they're happy because of that. But I think also there was such a dark cloud with the uncertainty surrounding Carmelo Anthony's status with this team, his future with the club, his feuding with Phil Jackson. Now Jeff Hornacek is, is the coach of this team. He's getting to run the offense that he wants to run, and we're seeing this, that success on the floor with the Knicks. Their players are enjoying a more open style on the court, and they're just feeling good about the way they're playing and how they're playing, and just that there's no drama off the court with that the Phil and Carmelo constant turmoil. So that, I think, is what has led to this breath of fresh air for this franchise right now. You know what I'm feeling good about, Ian? It's been a couple of days since I talked to you. Your beer game right now, I see a lot of chimneys in your future this yes. weekend. I'm just saying. Looking good, brother. Uh, <laughs> Chris Dash Porzingis averaging 25.5 points, 2.1 blocks per game this season. A reminder, he's 22. So he's a baby unicorn, my little pony. And yet he's already a horse, as Ian pointed out. Only player younger than that to put up those numbers in a season. Who that? Shaq, mm. back in 93, 94, before L was born. Please. <laughs> All right, so the Seahawks have become the first team to receive a monetary fine for violating the concussion protocol. Uh, this as it relates to Russell Wilson not being properly checked after he took a hit to the chin from Carlos Dansby way back on November 9th. So they're docked $100,000 and members of the organization have to go through remedial concussion protocol training, Adam Schefter. So closure to this particular incident. The league also revised its policy as a result of this incident. So what's really the purpose of the fine and the remedial training and, and what impact will that have? The fine is a slap on the wrist. What does it really mean? But I think the bigger thing is that the league sent out a message to the rest of the teams in the league saying that you cannot have players declare themselves okay to re-enter the game. They have to be cleared by a medical professional on your team. In this particular incident, Russell Wilson went to the sideline I'm good. Told the team, I'm, I'm going back in. I yeah. feel fine. Right. fine. And he went back in. And we've seen that too many times this year. Now, I know the NFL has had 500 different evaluations, and only two have resulted in investigations. This and the ongoing one with Tom Savage. Exactly. I was asking about that. We see the results here. A $100,000 fine, remedial training for the medical and coaching staffs of the Seattle Seahawks. But I think the bigger message is that everybody saw it, and the league wants to make an example of it. Okay. And send them a message that players – are not in positions to clear themselves to go back into games. It just makes, must come from medical professionals. It just makes you wonder when you're basically finding, to your point, money that Paul Allen has in his coat, in his coat pocket or his couch even. It's like, does it really curb the type of behavior that we've been seeing from teams or players, as the case may be, rushing to get Look, back into th- th- a game? This is about trying it. to change the culture. And the NFL has taken steps to improve it. Yep. But there's still a ways to go here. Long way to go. And the league is still working. Long way to go. Okay. Uh, Giants got some work to do. They need somebody. They need a new boss when it comes to general manager. You saw Dave Gettleman, who they have a lot of familiarity with, interviewed yesterday. A guy we have a lot of familiarity with. Hey, I know that guy. Louis Riddick interviewing today with the New York Giants. So, let's see. We've lost Aaron Boone to the Yankees. (laughs) Herm to Arizona State. We're losing Lou Riddick. (laughs) Very good. (laughs) You know? I love that, Michael. Listen. He's qualified, and he'd be a no great question. addition for the New York Giants. Now, they've interviewed Dave Gettleman. They've interviewed Mark Ross. They're going to interview more people. They want to move on the GM before they move on the coach. There may be a candidate on a team that they want to talk to, like a Nick Casario in New England, but they can't talk to that guy until the season ends. So the interesting question now becomes, are they comfortable enough with Lewis Riddick or Dave Gettleman or whoever they choose before they go and talk to any existing mm-hmm. personnel GMs. There are a lot of people out there on a lot of other teams. Joey Klingscales in Oakland, Terry McDonough in Arizona, Nick Casario in New England, George Payton in Minnesota that basically have great reputations. Are the Giants, had they met somebody that has been convincing enough that they are willing to forego the yeah. chance to talk to all those other people? But you're right about the ESPN trend. They're producing hey. GMs and coaches. And if you, Did a you great job here. Too, and Lo- Lewis is worthy. And if you watch ESPN, you know he can make an impression on you. you yes, I, he can. As, as besides yes, he his can. pre-existing qualifications. Hey, if you talk to him before I do, just tell him I'll be his director of college scouting or something. And I'll be assistant GM, and L will be... Head of communication. Look. There we go. Hey! We got the whole front <laughs> office all taken care of. Do you love that in our all current job team. we're asking for another job? <laughs> wow. Maybe we should bypass that. Let's yeah. talk about a story that came down today that's going to have an immediate impact on the field, and that being the Rams kicker, Greg Zerline, out for the season. He is done. This guy leads the league in extra points, field goals, and points scored. What yeah. kind of impact will this have as they streak to the playoffs? Well, you just said it. 
He's the leading scorer in the NFL. So Megatron. We, so, so we could talk about Todd Gurley. We could talk about Melvin Gordon. We could talk about Julio Jones. You can talk about any play you want. He scored more than any of them. So now they bring in a kicker who's never kicked in the regular season, yeah. who's never kicked in the postseason. Now, the one thing that this team has going for it, it believes that John Fossil can get out of its kicker. John Fossil, the special teams coach, can get out of their kicker what Sean McVay did out of their quarterback. Okay. That's how much faith they have in the special teams coach, Sean Fossil. Yeah, he does and because of that, they're not as panicked as other people are. But it's a huge blow to them. And it's a huge blue blow to old people who roster Greg Zerline yeah. who are in their fancy <laughs> yeah. football championships. Do you realize that he has been rostered on 36.9% of the roster is playing for a championship, a fantasy championship this weekend, behind only Alvin Kamara and Todd Gurley? Wow, wow. that's something. And just like in fantasy, those 11, 12 points can make a difference. In reality, you're talking about a loss that could shape the, the way the NFC playoffs play out with a guy that can kick, that's known to be able to kick from 55 and beyond. That's why they call him Legatron. You can't get that from maybe your kicker now. That could make the difference between whether Sean McVay's Rams go deep into the postseason or not. So huge ramifications. People say, oh, he's just a kicker. Not just any kicker. That's why the they best call him kicker. Legatron. Huge yeah. ramifications of this day. This is Adam Schefter's birthday, by the way. Thank you for spending time with us on your birthday, Chef man. Chef Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Happy My pleasure. Birthday. So much focus on the catch, no catch, and the fake spike pick. But as Al mentioned earlier, the real highlight of the game and one of the best images from Week 15 mm-hmm. sighted Ryan Shazier strong enough after spinal stabilization surgery to wave the terrible towel at Heinz Field. Now, his father provided us an update today uh, saying, quote, we have seen some improvement that is encouraging. We're taking it one day at a time. We do not know what tomorrow holds. It's a daily journey we don't know. But I know God is getting the message. Can I get an amen? Uh, amen. It's easy to be faithful in a storm. We're not talking about a drizzle. We're talking about a hurricane, a Category 5 hurricane. Lots of metaphors to describe it. Ryan had two goals going into the year, a Pro Bowl and a Super Bowl. He's been able to check one off the list. He's hoping to check the next one off. That quote courtesy of our Jeremy Fowler, who joins us now. Uh, Jeremy, after Tuesday, it seems the Steelers have tried to induce a case of amnesia when it comes to that meltdown against the Patriots and turn the page to Houston. But their teammate and their brother, of course, remains top of mind. So how much of a pick-me-up has Shazia's progress provided Pittsburgh's locker room? Well, Ryan, you could say that Shazier and the Steelers have a mutual beneficial relationship right now because Shazier is feeding off the energy of the Steelers on the field, and the Steelers are certainly feeding off Shazier's energy. Now, Vernon Shazier, his father, when I spoke to him earlier today, he said that when Ryan went to the game Sunday against the Patriots, he was in that Heinz Field box. They showed him on the Jumbotron waving that terrible towel. He said that was like therapy for both him and the team. And the, the family has sort of limited visitors for the most part now that they're two to three weeks into this injury, but players are still going back and forth to say what's up. And T.J. Watt told me that he was amazed at how much Ryan just wanted to talk football. He wanted nothing to do with his injury or anything else in the world. He wanted to talk about game planning, playing outside linebacker the rest of the way. And so he is locked in. He wants you know, He made that Pro Bowl, which is the goal is. Now he wants to get the Steelers to a Super Bowl somehow. And Ryan's father was really saying that they are feeding off any energy they can get from prayers around the country. He said, we have about a million plus people praying for us right now, and it feels good. Two of them on this set. We appreciate it, Jeremy Fowler. Thank you. So Brian Bowen was the former five-star prospect who found himself at the center of the Louisville basketball scandal that led to the firing of both Hall of Fame coach Rick Pitino and athletic director Tom Urich. Now, the FBI alleging that the reason that he made the 11th hour decision to even commit to Louisville was because Adidas funneled $100,000 to his father, Brian Bowen Sr., per a request by the school. Bowen speaking exclusively and for the first time with our Jeff Goodman about his role in the scandal. What was the discussion like with you and your parents when you told them you were ready to commit to Louisville? Uh, At that point, it was really like, um, you know, this is a last minute thing. I pretty much have to make a decision, you know, that's, that's really uh, what it came down to, me making a decision quick. Did you sense any sort of added pressure from your parents no. to go to Louisville? No, 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 not at all, never. Like I said, they're, they're for me, and, you know, whatever I decide is what they're going to roll with. So the FBI says that there was a payment involving two former Adidas employees, involving Christian Dawkins, also a money guy, to a family member. What did you know about this? I didn't know anything, anything at all. 
The same way the whole media found out is the same way I found out. What was Dawkins' involvement in your recruitment? I would say it's a guy I could go to like, is this a trustworthy guy? Anytime I need to ask anything, whether it's about a coach or about the team or just anything at all, that's, that's a guy I could go to. How do you feel about him? You know, I see all of the, I've you know seen all the reports about him and everything, and if the allegations are you know truly true, I'm, I'm, I'm really mad. I can't I can't say where I want to. I'm I'm really mad, you know, at him. So when you heard your your dad was involved, how did you react to that? I mean, I really didn't believe it. I still didn't believe it. To this day, I still, you know, I really didn't believe it. Brian, has your dad come to you at all to try to explain everything that's gone down and what's happened? Mm-mm, because I know that I, I don't want to know anything. Like, whatever's, whatever's happened, I don't want to know anything about it. I just want to see what happens with all the outcomes and everything. I've let him know that, you know, I'm very upset as far as, you know, not being able to play and everything, but as far as, you know, the investigation and everything and all that, I don't even want to talk about it at all. So I just, you know, brush that past. Who do you blame for the position you're in right now? Um, there's not one specific person I could say I could blame. Just greedy adults as a whole. Really just the greedy adults. Let's bring in, in Jeff Goodman and I'm there was a there's a lot to unpack in that interview. Even just that little snippet. You sat down with them. I mean, what was your biggest takeaway? Yeah, I mean, the biggest takeaway for me, El, was him saying that his relationship with his father is better. They're closer now than they were before before all this happened. And that, to me, kind of raises some eyebrows. But this is a kid who's an only child, who's extremely close with his mother and father. And he said, listen, my father's been there every step of the way. I don't blame him for anything that might have happened. And they haven't really talked about it. And that's the part that baffles uh, probably not just me, but a lot of people, that they haven't had discussions about what's gone on. But maybe Brian Bowen just doesn't want to know uh, at this point in time what his father might have done in this situation. You could understand in terms of being complicit, the more you know, the worse the situation for you. But again, yeah, to think that he wouldn't talk to his father about something that cost him an opportunity to play at Louisville and took down two huge names in the sport. With that being said, all that being said, this kid still, while he's not on the basketball team, attends school at Louisville. Did you talk to him about what that's like? Yeah, he just finished his first semester. He's staying in Louisville until he figures out where his his next move is going to be. He's hoping to play college basketball somewhere else. But I asked him, what was it like? And he said, you know what? People came up to him. They were extremely supportive, nice, not a bad word on campus from a student or by anybody. So Brian Bowen said, you know, I was just kind of a regular student. At first it was difficult because he felt like everybody was talking behind his back. But as it went on, it was a life of normalcy for Brian Bowen at Louisville, and that's why he stayed to finish up the first semester. And, oh, by the way, he got a 3.4. And that's really all that matters, doesn't it? Jeff Goodman, thank you for bringing us that interview and offering your perspective uh, on the exclusive interview with Brian Bowen for the first time speaking out. Look, we got a five-game palette. Which team shouldn't be playing on Christmas Day? I'm going to let Chris go first. And this is our honorary undefeated guy, Chris Haynes. Let's, let's get your words first. Yeah. Who in the world in their current state on Christmas Day, right after you open your presents under the tree, everybody is filled with joy, then you turn the game on and you're looking at the New York Knicks as currently constructed. I, I, look, I, I, I love, I love the young talent they have. But right now, nobody wants to see James Chris on Stapps? the team. The unicorn? Nobody. Nobody. You not don't right want to now. see the unicorn. That's about it. Not the, right now. That's about Ooh. it. The unicorn. Maybe right hard, maybe Tim Hardaway Jr. for a little bit. I don't know. I mean, that's not right now. now. That, that that's where I'm Mello's at. not walking through that door. Mello is not walking through that door, but he is walking through Oklahoma Ooh. City's door, and that's a great transition into the team I don't think should be playing on Christmas. Mm. I mean, this is the big three of nothing. This is the big three of A-R-A-P. These are old guys. They don't know how to play together. God bless Russell Westbrook, but he has not welcomed Paul George and Carmelo Anthony properly into the Thunder world and shown them how to play actually like the Thunder used to play. That team is getting beat by everybody at the horn, and I'll tell you what. Russell Westbrook, a Western Conference coach, told me, greatest line about him whatsoever, Russell Westbrook, plays great basketball. 
He's not a great basketball player, and there's a big difference. Yikes. Mm. Oh. Well, I'm going to surprise all you guys. I hate it on you, Westbrook. <laughs> God, I'm going to surprise all you guys. Mm. What team is always on Christmas? Lakers. Yeah, the Lakers. This ain't Kobe's Lakers. You're right. Not Shaq's, not Kareem's, not Wilt's. I'm not gonna even say George Mikan's. I don't care if Lonzo Ball is there. You know why I don't think they're gonna, they should be on Christmas? Because I don't think LeVar Ball is going to be able to be there. <laughs> oh. The Lakers are banning him from games. <laughs> His two boys are going to Lithuania yeah. to play, so he's probably going to be in, like, negative 50-degree weather getting his boys acclimated to the freezing cold, hooping out there. He's, not, he's the biggest entertaining thing with the Lakers. Kuzma's my boy. Well, I can tell you right now. But no, nah, the, the Lakers shouldn't be on na- Christmas. If the national media, Maybe next year, but not right now. If the national media is in Lithuania, he'll go there. They will not be. They will be at the Staples Center. LeVar Ball will be there, trust he me. He will be there. He's the Marine and, One of Helicopter. There's no way LeVar misses Staples. If he can't get into Staples, he will be outside Staples with a media conglomerate waiting for That's him. That's right. To speak up be a big so one. then the game, they shouldn't be playing. We should just be outside talking to him. Yes. Now, I, Le- LeVar Ball and me and Christmas is a great way to spend the Don't holiday. give us any ideas. All right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. A bunch of Scrooges over here. <laughs> One of those three Grinches, Mark Spears yeah. from the Undefeated, <laughs> joining the program now. Justin Tinsley and three Grinches. First of all, who else you want to see 1030 at night play a home game? The Clippers, the Suns, the Kings, maybe the Blazers. But look here. Lonzo Ball, double figures in four straight games. Seems like he might be figuring it out. Now, that was taped in fairness, Spears. That was a tape segment. Kuzma went for 38 with seven threes last night. Hmm. Are you interested in watching the Lakers on Christmas now? No. Put an asterisk next to that game. They, they won when Chris Paul got hurt. Oh. This is a team with the 10th worst record in the NBA. Why aren't the Toronto Raptors playing? Let them play in St- Staples Center that late. The Toronto Raptors have the fourth best record in the NBA. Right. They're 21 and 8. They have two All Stars. And, and so, why do we want to see the Lakers? I'd rather, what about the Spurs? What about Kawhi Leonard? Why do these young kids who haven't done anything but won one game of note deserve to be playing on Christmas? Let them play their, pay their dues. All right, look, I'm not mad at you for finding a way to show some love for Masai Ujiri's and Dwayne Casey's Toronto Raptors. They don't get talked about enough as the Eastern Conference contender this year. But, okay, if the Lakers are to beat – if they beat Golden State Friday night, they lost by two on Kobe night and you were there, you might be interested in watching them on Christmas. Again, it's the nightcap. Nice sweater. Stand up and let the people see it real quick before we let you go. Stand up real quick. Hurry up. Uh, yeah. Snow, 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 I like snow, it. Snow, I like the Spears. Snow, snow, You come in third on today's show. Thank you, man. You know who I love? I love the lovable meathead, can't be stopped on the field Gronk. I don't like cheap shot Gronk, the one that stooped to this level in week 13 against the Bills, delivering this hit to Tredavious White that landed him a one-game suspension. So ahead of their rematch, White saying he's moved on and can forgive and forget. But what is the rest of the team saying? We go out there and try to do anything selfish or anything to hurt the team, you know. We can cause ourselves you know, a playoff spot or, you know, cause ourselves one of our main players by going out there and doing something stupid. So we need everybody. Uh, it's going to be a total team effort. And uh, you know, we're going to definitely need everybody on the field to beat this team. So, you know, we, we're going to put that on the back and just like that. Yeah, we are a family. We understand that. We, uh, we like to, we like to, uh, to be... You know, hanging out with each other inside and outside the locker room, um, and so when something like that happens, you want to stick up for them. But you know, you gotta you gotta stay within the rules and, and the regulations of the game. Okay, so let's pull in our Patriots reporter Mike Reese, because I mean, listen, I can't imagine that the Bills are gonna be like, yes, we're gonna retaliate. And here's what's coming. But what do the Patriots players themselves think about any possible retaliation against Gronk? Well, L, that's been a popular. T- uh, topic that the players have been asked about from reporters this week and Patriot safety Devin McCourty one of the team's captains probably summed it up best when he said look I don't think either team is going to need what happened at the end of that game to get them going for this one this is much bigger than that and that's a reference really to what's at stake for both teams the Bills still fighting for a playoff spot the Patriots fighting for home field advantage and listen if that was one topic that they were asked a lot about in this week uh, the last couple days the other was that boston globe report about how tom brady's trainer alex guerrero had some privileges stripped away i should mention that brady uh, was supposed to answer questions from reporters today in front of this backdrop behind me he ended up pushing that until tomorrow almost it seemed like a way maybe to limit those distractions so we'll actually hear 
from Brady tomorrow, as well as Rob Gronkowski for the first time tomorrow after the Patriots' final practice of the week. Mike Reese with the 24-hour ahead-of-time tease. I appreciate you. Very good at your job joining us uh, live from Gotta Gillette. keep you posted. And, we'll, and we will be. Let's bring in a former Patriot, Teddy Bruschi. Yeah. Teddy. I used to play I, for Listen, I'm not. <laughs> little, little while, little bit, you, little you, bit. You, you, you want some with a, I am not advocating for violence or anything. I'm right. just saying. How would you have handled this back in the day if someone did that to your teammate? That's your family, right? That's your brotherhood. How do you go back at them? It is. You got to protect each other out there that time. It, it, it comes to a point where if something like that happens, they're talking about retaliation uh, for this game, but the retaliation was right at that moment. Yeah, the opportunity okay. passed. It passed. Yeah. You know, and you, when, you watch, when you watch Rob deliver the, the blow onto him on the ground and you just point at him, the, the, that was the time. Yeah. That was the time I... I probably would have lost it. I probably right. would have lost it there, but um, you can't retaliate now. Now it's about, it's got to give you motivation. Now. They're suspending I mean, people left and right. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, yes. you know, you're already going to tackle Gronk low to begin with. That's the only way to tackle Gronk low. So that's not real retaliation. And the thing is, the Bills, unlike most of you, Steady, you know this because y'all used to put them out earlier. They got something to play for. Right. So you can't afford to have somebody get ejected or perhaps suspended if you're in the playoff race. Which is, which is very unique, yes, yeah. with the Bills in it this long. And those messages coming out of the Bills, Bills locker room, those level-headed, cool, calm remarks, that's got to be McDermott. I mean, mm-hmm. he's doing a great job in there at keeping them focused. I hope that the Saturday night before the game and then the Sunday before the game, he's got something fiery to deliver because that's the time. That's the time where we've composed ourselves the entire week. Yeah. Now we all got to remember <laughs> right. what's going on here, right. people, and what we want. And we want to go in Let's there. get the real revenge. Yeah. I'm, I'm right. just saying, so, keep an eye on, like, the random dude that gets, like, pulled up from the practice the squad. <laughs> and and it comes so, in as a good <laughs> Hey, on the other side, <laughs> on the other side, the Patriots, I mean, they're, they're always looking ahead. You got you to gotta anticipate maybe some form of it coming. I think their intense, intensity yeah. level sure. will be just as high, especially Rob Gronkowski. All right, let's get to uh, uh, some bad news with another safety in another big game. That'll be Kenny Vaccaro of the New Orleans Saints. Big blow to the Saints defense ahead of that big matchup with the Falcons. A versatile veteran safety placed on injury reserve with a lingering groin injury. Leads the team with 48 solo tackles. Has career-high three picks. Uh, third on the team with 650 snaps. So that's something to keep an eye out for there. Uh, good news now. Remember when the Falcons had the best backfield in the NFC South? Mm-hmm. Well, Devontae Freeman balled out against the Bucks, and now he gets his boy Tevin Coleman back for Sunday's rematch with the Saints. Coleman having cleared the concussion protocol. Alvin Kamara missed most of the Falcons' Week 14 win in the concussion protocol when he took a shot to the head from Deion Jones. Said he was annoyed to be knocked out and excited for that second shot. Mm, it's got to be a wake-up call, though, for a young player. When you, when you get hit like that, yeah. when you get hit like that, it's like, whoa. Everything was going so perfectly. For yeah, that rookie point. year, exploding on rookie. Blue Moon is brewed with Valencia orange peel and a touch of coriander. It's a creative twist on a Belgian-style wheat ale for a taste that shines brighter. Taste responsibly. Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. This is Sports Center at 6. As King James and the Cavs face the hottest team in the East, Isaiah Thomas is officially closer to his return, and his attitude is worse. Why, that's actually a good thing. He tweaked his knee last week, but his mouth works just fine. Chris Porzingis sits with Rachel Nichols. Are the Pats worried about the Bills retaliating for this Gronk hit? We're live in Foxborough. And an OTL exclusive, the Louisville recruit at the center of a controversy that cost Rick Potato his job on what he knew about a big money payment. Hey, what's good? Welcome to Sports Center. Our show's still gifted and graced with the presence of L. Duncan. Speaking of gifts, later we'll talk to the Grinch who's trying to steal the greatness of the NBA on Christmas. And Jadevian Clowney won't get cold in his stocking, but he did get a pretty trashy gift <laughs> from yes. Jags fans. Plus, how Jacksonville's opponent this Sunday, San Francisco, finally struck gold in its search for a quarterback. Yeah, but let's start with the 6-6 Cavs with their final tune-up before their much-hyped Christmas bout with the Dubs. Don't look past Chicago, though, something no one thought we'd be saying a month ago, Mike. After these teams met, so the Bulls, they've won seven straight, led by Nikola Mirotic, formerly known as the guy who got punched in the face by his teammate. Formerly known as the heartbeat of the Celtics was Isaiah Thomas. He has yet to strap up for Cleveland, but he's getting close, and LeBron's putting us on attitude notice. 
Yeah, his attitude is getting worse and worse. Because <laughs> he's getting closer and closer. When you get closer and closer to something that you love and you want, your attitude actually gets worse. So, you know. so then IT tweeted, can I still be an all-star? The answer actually is um, yes, because Alonzo Mourning was selected in 2001, having played no games before the All-Star break started. So there it is. Let's talk to our Cavs reporter, Dave McMenamin, who's live from Quicken. Give us a progress report on IT. Well, L, all signs pointing positive. Uh, he went through a full scrimmage today with the Canton Charge. They actually came up uh, about the hour and a half drive to Cleveland to practice at the Cavs facility in Independence, Ohio. Uh, but even though it, all, all signs pointed to positive progress from that first time playing five-on-five, Ty Lue told us pregame tonight that Isaiah Thomas will not be on the court come Monday for that Christmas Day showdown against the Golden State Warriors. So as much hype there is behind that game, and, and certainly people are going to tune in to ABC to watch the Cavs, and the Warriors, you're not going to see Steph Curry. He was ruled out earlier this week, and you won't see Isaiah Thomas. So the point guard battle, not quite as attractive as, say, the small forward battle between Kevin Durant and LeBron James. Uh, exactly. But with the hip injury, why rush him back? Cavs have won 18 of their last 20. They good. Dave McMenamin joining us live from Quicken ahead of the Cavs and the Bulls. Mike? Celtics coming off taking an L to the Heat last night in New York tonight. Chris Dabbs Porzingis has been out the past two games due to lingering soreness in his left knee. Not believed to be serious. Knicks just being cautious. Ian Begley is the unicorn in tonight. He hopes to be in. The Knicks hope that he is in tonight, but we're still not sure. The Knicks held a closed-door shoot-around earlier today. We can assume that Porzingis tested his knee and was examined by team doctors. We should find out his status definitively in a few minutes here. But in talking to Porzingis yesterday, he seemed pretty confident that he'd be able to take the court tonight. He practiced in full yesterday. He didn't feel a lot of discomfort. He said, hey, guys, if nothing changes between now, which was yesterday, and tonight, I'll be able to play. And the Knicks really need him back. You know, they are 2-4 and four in games in which Porzingis has missed due to injury, and they're just a different ball club without number six on the floor. Not only is he giving them a ton on the offensive end, tied for fourth in the NBA in scoring, he's also doing a fantastic job around the rim, averaging 2.1 blocks per night. So the Knicks are holding their breath right now that Porzingis can play. Yeah, we'll put those numbers in context momentarily. So they got Detroit tomorrow night, Christmas Day against Philly. Knicks currently eighth in the East at 16-4. Ian, I saw your piece on ESPN.com going inside the implosion that rebuilt the New York Knicks. Uh, This quote from one of your team's sources stood out to me. Quote, everyone just seems a little lighter. The drama Phil created with Carmelo really affected the team and the joy factor. How has that newfound or perhaps rediscovered joy manifested itself in the Knicks play? Well, Mike, as you know, winning helps everything. So the Knicks are sitting here 16 and 14. They're they're winning games, so they're happy because of that. But I think also there was such a dark cloud with the uncertainty surrounding Carmelo Anthony's status with this team, his future with the club, his feuding with Phil Jackson. Now Jeff Hornacek is is the coach of this team. He's getting to run the offense that he wants to run, and we're seeing that success on the floor with the Knicks. Their players are enjoying a more open style on the court, and they're just feeling good about the way they're playing and how they're playing, and just that there's no drama off the court with that the Phil and Carmelo constant turmoil. So that, I think, is what has led to this breath of fresh air for this franchise right now. You know what I'm feeling good about, Ian? It's been a couple of days since I talked to you. Your beer game right now, I see a lot of chimneys in your future this weekend. I'm just saying. Looking good, brother. Uh, (laughs) Chris Dabbs Porzingis is averaging 25.5 points, 2.1 blocks per game this season. A reminder, he's 22. So he's a baby unicorn, my little pony. And yet he's already a horse, as Ian pointed out. Only player younger than that. To put up those numbers in a season. Who that? Shaq. Mm. Back in 93, 94, before L was born. Please. <laughs> All right, so the Seahawks have become the first team to receive a monetary fine for violating the concussion protocol. Uh, this as it relates to Russell Wilson not being properly checked after he took a hit to the chin from Carlos Dansby way back on November 9th. So they're docked $100,000 and... Members of the organization have to go through remedial concussion protocol training, Adam Schefter. So closure to this particular incident, the league also revised its policy as a result of this incident. So what's really the purpose of the fine and the remedial training and and what impact will that have? 
the fine is a slap on the wrist. What does it really mean? But I think the bigger thing is that the league sent out a message to the rest of the teams in the league saying that you cannot have players declare themselves okay to re-enter the game. They have to be cleared by a medical professional on your team. In this particular incident, Russell Wilson went to the sideline I'm good. told the team, I'm, sure. I'm going back in. I feel no. fine. Right. fine. And he went back in. And we've seen that too many times this year. Now, I know the NFL has had 500 different evaluations, and only two have resulted in investigations. This and the ongoing one with Tom Savage. Exactly. I was asking about that. We see the results here. $100,000 fine, remedial training for the medical and coaching staffs of the Seattle Seahawks. But I think the bigger message is that everybody saw it, and the league wants to make an example of it. Okay. And send them a message that players are not in positions to clear themselves to go back into games. It just makes, must come from medical professionals. It just makes you wonder when you're basically finding, to your point, money that Paul Allen has in his coat, in his coat pocket or his couch even. It's like, does it really curb the type of behavior that we've been seeing from teams or players, as the case may be, rushing to get Look, back into th- th- a game? This is about trying it. to change the culture. And the NFL has taken steps to improve it. Yep. But there's still a ways to go here. Long way to go. And the league is still working. Long way to go. Okay. Uh, Giants got some work to do. They need somebody. Yeah. They need a new boss when it comes to general manager. You saw Dave Gettleman, who they have a lot of familiarity with, interview yesterday. A guy we have a lot of familiarity with. Hey, I know here. that guy. Lewis Riddick interviewing today with the New York Giants. So, let's see. We've lost Aaron Boone to the Yankees. <laughs> Herm to Arizona State. We losing Lou Riddick. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> you know? I love that, Michael. Listen. He's qualified, and he'd be a great addition for the New York Giants. Now, they've interviewed Dave Gettleman. They've interviewed Mark Ross. They're going to interview more people. They want to move on the GM before they move on the coach. There may be a candidate on a team that they want to talk to, like a Nick Casario in New England, but they can't talk to that guy until the season ends. So the interesting question now becomes, are they comfortable enough with Lewis Riddick or Dave Gettleman or whoever they choose before they go and talk to any existing Mm -hmm. personnel GMs. There are a lot of people out there on a lot of other teams. Joey Klingscales in Oakland, Terry McDonough in Arizona, Nick Casario in New England, George Payton in Minnesota that basically have great reputations. Are the Giants, had they met somebody that has been convincing enough that they are willing to forego the chance to talk to all those other people? But you're right about the ESPN trend. They're producing hey. GMs and coaches. And if you, Did a great job here. Too, and Lewis, Lewis is worthy. And if you watch ESPN, you know he can make an impression on you. you yes, I, he and, can. And, and besides yes, he his can. pre-existing qualifications. Doing? Hey, if you talk to him before I do, just tell him I'll be his director of college scouting or something. And I'll be assistant GM, and L will be... Head of communication. Look. There we go. Hey! We got the whole front <laughs> office all taken care of. Do you love that in our all current job team. we're asking for another job? <laughs> wow. Maybe we should bypass that. Let's yeah. talk about a story that came down today that's going to have an immediate impact on the field, and that being the Rams kicker, Greg Zerline, out for the season. He is done. This guy leads the league in extra points, field goals, and points scored. What kind of impact will this have as they streak to the playoffs? Well, you just said it. He's the leading scorer in the NFL. Legatron. So so we could talk about Todd Gurley. We could talk about... You put Dan Levitard on the show at the end of the show yesterday. I don't put him on the show. I'm not in charge, but go ahead. Because he had an exchange with Commissioner Manfred. Right. I fell asleep shortly after I got home last night. I had a dream that me and Dan Levitard went on a date. Okay? It was all going well until my husband showed going up. Going well? It was going well. I mean, like, no, 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 Mike. We were just hanging. It was a good. We were he took me to, like, a I mean, nice sharing. Cuban restaurant. We were having a good time. Cuban restaurant, okay. And then my husband showed up. And come popular. to find out, I only went on the date with Dan in retaliation because my husband had been arrested for stealing a TV out of a neighbor's house. Damn, Omar. That's an amazing dream. All right, so here's what we know about Kristaps Porzingis. Um, He's really good. Like, the only other player to put up his stats at his age is Shaq. Good. Uh, Let's see, he's Latvian. He is the sole catalyst for the overuse of the unicorn emoji. But have you ever wondered what the average New Yorker says to him on the streets or whether he can dance or what Christmas looks like Latvian style? Well, you're in luck. From his, what I assume is a penthouse apartment in the city, Rachel Nichols sought the answers to the parts of Porzingod that you're likely less familiar with. Hello. How are you doing? I see, I see. How are you? <laughs> That much you can go underneath. You definitely have to duck for this. Yeah, it's just everywhere. It's a small world for me. (laughs) 
We are here in your apartment building. You get the bright lights, big city around you. People always marvel at your comfort level in New York. I mean, you're seven foot three. So in New York, I think a lot of celebrities still get to be kind of anonymous, but you can't be. What is the reaction like when you walk around the streets here? Yeah, I can't hide. That's the thing. I can't hide. I can't just put on a hoodie and, right. and walk around. It's impossible. Nobody in New York is afraid to express their opinion. So I assume you get lots of advice. Oh, yeah. I think... 90% of people in New York knows how to do my job better than myself. Yeah. You know? Clearly. Definitely. Do this, do that on court. You gotta you gotta be more you gotta shoot more, you gotta pass more. Like obviously they just want me to succeed and, and play well and and they're you know rooting for me, so that's good. I mean last year was so crazy. You had all the issues going on with Carmelo and Phil Jackson. You had so much losing and kind of just tumbled into each other. How different is it this season? Yeah. It's a different atmosphere this year and definitely it's um it feels like, you know, some, some fresh air. We have more freedom, we're, we're just playing. The coach, uh, you could tell that he's he has more freedom and it's it feels more natural now. There's still a lot that people don't know about you. For instance, I don't know if people know about your dance skills, which I think are pretty legendary. We were dancing also after games and like, it was a lot of, there's a lot of um, silly stuff that we were doing. I mean, have you thought about breaking this out during next game? The dance? Yeah. Ah, I don't really dance. They, they made me do that. <laughs> <laughs> no one made you do that. that is, those moves are natural, my friend. No, no, they forced me to do it. <laughs> All right, we are sitting down around Christmas time. What do they do in Latvia for Christmas that we don't do here? Uh, I think it's like exactly the same. We, yeah. yeah. I think we eat a lot of food and, and, and you know. You are just like Americans then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's it's pretty much the same. Can you wish me at least happy Christmas in Latvian? Pretty gzim svetks. I was going to try to repeat that, and now I'm not going to. <laughs> One more time. Pretty gzim svetks. No, not going to happen. But Merry Christmas back to you. Thank you. <laughs> Poor God averaging t- over 25 points and two blocks per game this season. Reminder, he is 22, Mike. He's what were you doing when you were 22? What? As in last year, what were you doing? Please. As in 12 years ago, um, I was actually doing this. I was doing radio. My little pony. But he's a big horse. He's the only player younger than that to put up these numbers. Look at that guy. Shaquille O'Neal. You wrote, the my little pony. you wrote the My Little Pony. He's made a case for his first you All-Star did. Game appearance. There it is. Voting open earlier today at NBA.com. I'll read my own copy next time. Yeah, it sounded I made good it in my so head. It was so awkward. It was good. I just made it awkward. This is what happens when we go longer than we should. We usually call this show the six, but tonight we're the seven. Because the people needed more L. Duncan, uh, who strategically standing with her feet pointed out so she could show off the J. Oh, wait, no. Leading up to our college it. football bowl countdown show on ESPN. But first, back to the Celtics Knicks matchup. We gave you a feel there for Porzingis. Let's get the Boston perspective. Celtics <laughs> took a rare L last night. Well, actually, not lately. Losing to <laughs> Kelly Olenek's Miami Heat. Olenek going for 32 on 6 of 8 from 3. Scored the Heat's final 8 points. Kyrie had a chance at the end but couldn't get it to fall. Jason Tatum says he's good to go with that dislocated finger. However, Jalen Brown warming up before the Knicks game. And we'll see if he plays tonight. The Celtics still have the NBA's best record. But have, relatively speaking, struggled a little bit as of late. Going 500 in the last 8 Two fall to 74 in December, while Boston's offense has actually improved recently. Their defensive efficiency ranks a mere 15th so far this month, having led the NBA in that category in October and November. My homie Chris Forsberg joins me now. So, Chris, as I mentioned, the Celtics have lost four of their past eight after losing just four of their first 26. Why is Boston, relatively speaking, struggling? Well, Mike, Coach Brad Stevens won't let them use it as an excuse, but you do feel like there's a little bit of fatigue setting in right now. The Celtics are going to play their league-high 35th game tonight. Not only that, but this is the fifth in seven nights, the third in four nights, back-to-back. You know, this is tough for this team. they got a trip coming up to London next month, but they're going to have to play 41 of their games by January 3rd. And again, I just think they're a little bit tired out there, and they're a little bit dinged up. Like you said, Jalen Brown's going to test out his leg tonight. You think about Jason Tatum appearing on the six last night, and you guys cursed him. He goes out there and dislocates his pinky. He is going to play too. tonight, but yeah. you know they're just—they're <laughs> just nursing these little dings and stuff, and they're just trying to get through it. And here's the other thing, Mike—they haven't practiced. 
Brad Stevens isn't looking forward to Christmas. He's not looking forward to New Year's. They got a practice scheduled on December 30th, and that's all he wants to get to so he can have two hours to get all this rust off his team and figure out what's going wrong. Chris Forsberg, always sharp. Appreciate the intel from New York, man. Thank you. <laughs> the pregame HQ is brought to you by Domino's. Are you set for the game? Get ready for kickoff and order now at dominoes.com. The pregame starts here. Yo, remember when we were already looking ahead to next year and putting Eli Manning in a Jaguars uniform? Yes. Yeah, that was fun for a minute. For everyone other than Blake Bortles, I imagine. But that was before Blake Bortles became the second coming to Mark Brunel. Bortles leads all QBs this month in yards per attempt, touchdown to interception ratio and total QBR. First quarterback in Jaguars history to throw multiple touchdowns without a pick in three consecutive games. And if you don't believe me, here it is for you to read and see for yourself. And yet, despite the Jags outscoring the Texans 74-14 with Bortles throwing four touchdowns and no picks in two meetings with Houston this year, my man Jadevian Clowney, like Black Thought said, he loses a grip of what garbage means. With T.J. Yates under center for Houston, I might add. Clowney called Bortles trash after Sunday's game, to which Bortles responded yesterday. I could care less. Um, you know, if if how you know we're playing and how I'm playing is is you know if that's trash, then I'm fine with being trash. All right. So in the giving spirit, this is what I love about Jaguars fans. The few of them that are out there, um, yeah, they, have dis- they have they have decided- a lot of fans. They do. <laughs> they do. They have now decided that they are sending trash cans, courtesy of Amazon Prime, to the <laughs> to the Texans facility. Attention, Jadavion Clown. That's clever. It is clever. I like it. It's like nine bucks, and like they have the receipts and everything. Mm. I'm very petty. And Teddy Bruski, if you're watching the show today, you'll think I hate quarterbacks, and that's not the truth. But I'm laughing when I'm listening to Mike Reed. Bortles is the first quarterback in Jags history to throw multiple touchdowns without a pick in three whole games. I'm sorry. Please convince surprising. me. It is. I'm, it's not surprising. I'm All they have is Mark Brunel. All they have is Mark Brunel. There's not like a whole laundry list no, of quarterbacks. They're not the 49ers. No. Correct. They don't have a legacy at that position. Here's, well. here's my thing. Because I'm seeing you like nod, like, yeah, yeah, he's really good. Please convince me. No, <laughs> please convince me. You're too much, man. Please, Why do you think I was nodding like that? Please, please convince me that Blake Bortles is not. The 2017 version of Kirk Cousins in 2015, who, like, all we did was tout his QBR and his passer rating. It's the best in the league. And then when playoff time came around, he just disappeared. We're Tell t- me why this is different. We're talking three weeks, basically. Thank we're you. Starting in week 13. It's, it's, it's nothing. It's, it's tw- it's, the timing of it is very, it's very exciting. Yeah. The timing. If, if Even those numbers, if they drop off just a little bit and he continues those into late December, into the playoffs, that's exciting. It makes him, I mean, a Super Bowl contender, in my opinion. If, yeah. he, if Blake Bortles right. keeps this up, because the defense, the defense by far, they're the best in the game. No question. Yes. You know they can run it. Run the football. Yeah. Bortles brings this. Yeah. Accuracy 20-plus yards down the field, yeah. too, weeks 13 through 15. Very good. I don't know if he can, mm-hmm. first of all. I don't know how he's – I've seen quarterbacks get to the playoffs and it's done. Right. Because they're like – Lose it. Uh, uh, it's the playoffs and they can't handle it. So, this is a quarterback in Blake Bortles. I got to see more. I still have major doubts. Is he playing good? Yes, that's great. Jags fans should be excited. Yeah. I don't know yet. All I want to say in defense of that awesome full screen, okay, with those stats – is because I have been the biggest Blake Bortles basher. The dude never it, early in his career, you think he never knew what a line of scrimmage was. OK, he was good for garbage time, fantasy football points. But it really goes to show you that when you're the third overall pick, if you don't get it in the first three years, we're way too quick to declare somebody a bust. Maybe yeah. maybe we just maybe he just needed time. I'm not saying he's a second coming, but maybe he just needed more than a second sure. to sure. show that he was that guy. And I'm, he may never be. But you know what? They can win with him. You still over there laughing? Let's just let's just you know. Hey, you know. <laughs> to make you know, history after three games but wait, is incredible. We got to go. To, we got We got to go to break. But you know what would have been funny if I'd have told you earlier in the season that a marquee quarterback matchup or an intriguing one in Week 15 would have been Blake Bortles versus Jimmy, Jimmy Garoppolo. Garoppolo. Nice. Yes. Garopp- Garoppolo yes. looking like that dude too. But- you know what we're gonna see on the first day of 2018? Huh. Michigan and South Carolina. They'll reacquaint themselves in the Outback Bowl, their first meeting since 2013, which was coincidentally the Outback Bowl. Game talks prevailing in that one. Is that, that the one, one. where, um, Jadavion Clowney 
Level in, yeah. There we go. My car was it? Yeah. Whatever happens in this bowl, though, Mike, not enough for one particular Michigan alum who did not mince words when it came to his evaluation of Jim Harbaugh, former Michigan receiver Amani Toomer. To me, Harbaugh's not a supermodel. That's Paris Hilton. That's somebody who's given us nothing. But wait, 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 wait. He's saying Paris Hilton's a supermodel or Jim Harbaugh is Paris Hilton? He's saying that I Paris Hilton is a latter. supermodel. I hope he's not saying that. Correct. I think it's the latter. That, yeah, that, that he's saying Jim Harbaugh is Paris Hilton, it's who's, Paris not, a Hilton, who's not a supermodel. Who's not a supermodel. Continue. Just want to make sure we're clear. Say, yeah. Mm. yeah, continue. Um, he says, oh, we're going to Rome. Oh, we wear Michael Jordan shoes. I don't care. I want to beat Michigan State. I want to beat Ohio State. Hmm. That's the passion that I have for the program. For what it's worth, Michigan 1-5 and five against Sparty and the Buckeyes and Harbaugh's three seasons. Trevor Maddich up, Trevor? joining How's us going, now. Michael? Great. <laughs> do, you, do you agree or disagree with the assessment from Toomer on John Har- Jim Harbaugh? Jim Harbaugh is a supermodel. Is he? <laughs> yes. Previous stops at Stanford in the NFL. He was at the Paris Catwalk. Now in Michigan, he's back at the mall. And he's got to work his way back to the big time. But he's on the way to do it. And and taking the team to Europe, taking the team to Florida for the spring. All that is good because it makes them relevant. It makes them cool. And like it or not, this is a reality show world. And it makes Michigan the best reality show in college football with a nod to Lane Kiffin who's catching up fast at FAU. So I think that what he's doing now as he takes the time it's needed to build the team is making that team fun and recruits love it. Honeymoon period's over up there, though. Yes. Uh, well, <laughs> yes. She, she told you the record against Michigan State and Ohio State. So, speaking of Ohio State, since you talk Michigan, might as well talk about the Buckeyes, who I thought deserved to be in the playoff over Bama. But I'm over it. I'm over it. Uh-huh. Some also are making a case for